Good morning. Yay. I have too many Bibles. That's a good problem to have. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Isn't Jesus sweet? <clears throat> I don't say that. I think I said that last time. And I, I don't say that just to say it. Jesus really is sweet. Well, let's look at the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. If you will, open your Bibles to Mark 6, verses 6 through 13. We are going to pick up right where we left off last week. I'll give you a minute to turn there. If you're in your cell phones for the Bible, shame on you. I'm j- good, good. I'm glad you have your Bibles with you. I'm, t- I'm totally joking. All right. Everybody there? All right. Let's read this together. If you're not there yet, you can follow along on the screens. Sounds like this. We're going to start with the second half of verse 6, okay, and go through verse 13. reads like this. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for putting your teaching in written form, Lord, that we could come to it together as your church, as your body, as your bride, washed by the blood, ready to hear from you. Jesus, so that everyone knows I'm a weak man. I have no power. I have no strength to do any of this. Glorify your name. Preach this word. We're anxious for you. We're looking for you. We love you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right, so last week we talked about, let me get rearranged up here. Last week we talked about, with Pastor Dwayne, just a little bit before this, uh, in the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus goes back home. And in going back home, he has left his teaching that he's been doing around the Sea of Galilee. Um, As he comes home, he begins teaching in the synagogue. And that was his fashion. That was his normal thing to do. He would come home, really to any village he would go to, and the first place he would hit is the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he would teach the people. And we're going to hang on to that word, teach. But he would come in, and so that's what he did when he came to Nazareth. Now, if you remember from last week, Dwayne, Pastor Dwayne, really brought out this truth that because of who Jesus was in Nazareth, he was too familiar for them And he said this, and I've been pondering this all week long. It's been really fun. What dirt did they have on Jesus to not believe him? And I've thought of that, and I've thought of that, and I'm like, absolutely nothing. The answer is nothing, right? And so it leaves us with this question of why did they reject Jesus? Why would they reject someone who could not only preach and teach, but then with authority, he is doing miracles. Though it says that because of their unbelief, there wasn't much. But still, I mean, if I was sick and Jesus touched me and I was healed, (laughs) that's kind of significant, you know? I might not forget that. Yet, even in the face of that, they deny him. And that's where we pick up this week. And we'll start with uh, the end of chapter 6. And it says, And he wondered at their unbelief. Can you imagine that? The Savior coming home and staring in awe. Not at your love, but at your disbelief that I don't know what else to do for you. Not so great. So, he was going around the village's teaching. Now, I want to jump in on that. We're going to talk about this today. Um, And he was going around the village's teaching. First thing and foremost, Jesus, we just said, has been rejected by his own people. It even says earlier in Mark that his mothers and his brothers showed up at a house where Jesus was teaching, and they said, he has lost his mind. Hurry, let's go get him. (laughs) See, you're like... Whoa, everyone's really off, you know, but Jesus continues on. And again, here's his persistence. He's on again. Jesus says, okay, 
and then he moves on to other, other villages. He is totally not dissuaded. He is totally not upset by their disbelief. Yes, but it doesn't hamper his mission. Jesus is always moving. So, let's look at this word, teaching. It says, and he was going around the villages teaching. So, this is the substance of what Jesus is doing. And in the gospel of Mark, I haven't read it much, but it's fascinating. In the Gospel of Mark, we have so many action verbs. It's like the whole thing is like a Tom Cruise movie, and Jesus is Tom Cruise. And he's moving, and it's, it's going, and it's going, and it's going. It's just this momentum until this major point, and then wham, done. And so, again, we have this movement with the beginning of the word and. Circle that in your Bible, or make a mental note. Count how many times you see the word and through this passage. Anyway, he was going around the villages teaching. Let's hone in on that word. The word in the Greek for teaching is didasko. And I know, isn't that, isn't that exciting? Totally thrills me. I know nothing about Greek. Oh, and this is awesome. So, didasko in the Greek is teaching or to teach, to impart knowledge. Now, when using this word, and this is significant if you'll grab onto this, in using this word, we have two different elements of this word. Informational teaching, informational teaching, transformational teaching, okay? Informational teaching, transformational teaching. And to illustrate this, I was thinking of you guys, teens. We constantly have, right, in your schools, you have your teachers that give you a list, vocabulary words, or whatever. Do we still do that? Is that just me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I give you vocabulary words and they say, hey, here in a week we're going to test you on the definition of these vocabulary words. So you gather the information and you grab it really, really hard and they've pounded it into you that this is the definition for this word and there you go. You write it down on a quiz, you get 100 and then you drink a Coke and forget. Am I wrong? Come on, Car Carson's like... Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah, no, you do. Right, because it's informational teaching. It's, I'm just going to get something into your head, and I, over by rote, I'm going to get it into you. So that's informational teaching. I'm here to tell you that the word didasco, what Jesus is doing, is not that. It's just not. Instead, it's transformational teaching. Oh, if you'll grab this. It might change your life. It did. So, transformational teaching is Jesus brings doctrine, the truth of the kingdom, and implants it upon the flesh of your heart so that in the impartation of this truth into your life, the Spirit of God would then illuminate the scriptures in these people's lives. That's what he was doing. And in that moment... Your worldview changes from being here, and this is a part of me, to this truth and this doctrine has so ingrained itself down into the heart of who I am that when I see, I view everything from this lens. That is why in Nazareth, they were said they were astonished because he was teaching with authority. It wasn't, well, I think when Moses was writing, you know, the Ten Commandments, he thought, Jesus said, when he wrote, he... And it was transformational truth. And he wouldn't let go of it. Why do you think they were, where did this guy get this stuff? Right? They'd never heard anything like this before. And there's no one else in the world, you guys, that can do that. It's Jesus, through his word, implants the doctrine, the truth, the timeless, endless, forever, forever, forever truth of God into our lives that we would be transformed by what's being poured into us through his scriptures. Teaching. Jesus was teaching. Ooh, that was awesome. So much good, isn't it? It's good. Okay, so let's look at that concept throughout the rest of Scripture because Jesus didn't stop there. And, and rather, instead, you have the Apostle Paul. Well, back up. Before we get to Paul, let's go to um, Acts chapter 4, verse 1. The disciples really got this, that it wasn't just another religious kind of, yay, Oh, I see what you're saying. It's like, this is, everything's different because of this. What does Peter say? Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's like when you speak, everything goes, and I come alive. Yes. So, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have just healed a man. Jesus through Peter and John, right? Has just healed a man. 
No big deal. It was awesome. It was great. Until it says in chapter 4, verse 1, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed. Why? Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. See, it wasn't just good ideas. It was, they're changing things again. He's back. It's Jesus again. Why? Because the truth of Jesus has so indwelt them that now when they speak, Jesus shows up. Oh no, I thought we killed him 40 days ago. It's a big problem. Get it? Teaching? One more. Everyone's got to... One more. Maybe it'll help. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5. Paul picks up on the same thing. He says, But the goal, the goal of our instruction, teaching, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It didn't say the goal of our instruction is that you would know what to do when someone yells at you at 7-Eleven because you have your religious box to check off. It was the goal of our instruction is indwelling truth into your life that love would pour forth from a sincere heart. Transformational. Okay, transformational teaching. I know I took a while on that. The reason why is because this is the thrust of the passage. Jesus doesn't slow for a minute. It says in verse 7, and from that he was going around teaching in the villages and he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So we move into this new section Mark is bringing us into that not only is it enough for Jesus to be teaching, to be pouring forth to this gospel kingdom breaking into the world, it's not enough. I picked twelve. And now we're going to divide and conquer and off we go. If you look back on uh, Mark chapter 3, found this fascinating. Jesus calls them specifically, Mark chapter 3 verse 13, and it's like the language is the same. It's almost like if you've read before, Mark is like, remember? Remember what he did? Check it out. Verse 13 says, And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. That's weird. They came to him and he appointed twelve so that they would be with him. I like that. And that they would, that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. Turn back and listen to it in verse 6. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs that they, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Now, I'll just give a precursor. Due to time, we're probably not going to get through this whole thing. But I hope that the truth of the word would, would come out even in, if we have to skip around a little bit. So if you will, look at your Bible. It says, and he summoned the twelve. And so we're going to stop there for a second. Jesus summons the twelve. Do you remember what we just read in uh, Mark chapter 3? He summons the twelve to himself. That's significant. He himself chose whom he wanted and summoned them to himself. Why? To be with him. So that all the days that they're walking with Jesus, it's not seminars. It's, hey, would you smell my breath in the middle of the night? Because we're stuck together for the next three years. It's intimate. It's real. It's I'm watching you. You're watching me. It's this kind of intimacy. So Jesus summons the 12. Now, Jesus sends that 12, those who have been basking in, resting in. I can't get away from him. Sometimes I wish I could because he's kind of hard. I don't get it. I'm going to send those guys out. And notice what Mark adds here. He sends them out in pairs. That's significant. One, for companionship. And we see that all throughout the New Testament. Remember Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Peter and John. They go in pairs. Why? Because Jesus told them to do it. I love it. But, so, more than that though, check this out. In Deuteronomy 19 verse 6, what does it say? On the account of two witnesses something is declared true or something is rendered as right. Jesus sets them up for success. He says, when you go into the village and you preach and teach the gospel of the kingdom, guess what? Number two is right here going, I know, man, it's true. It's crazy, man. I know it's nuts. You know? And everyone's like, are they for real? And they go, well, it's proven. Not by the law of Moses. Because by two things, something is rendered as true. Now, in that he's confirming the gospel and then finally in this supplying Jesus and he gave them authority over the unclean spirit. 
in this movement of the gospel and this movement of the kingdom breaking into earth. I hope by now you've, we've gotten this. Maybe we haven't, and that's okay. We're not dealing with external things. We're dealing with the heart condition of man. Jesus, the teaching, right? Transformational teaching. Jesus is bringing something here that is brand new. Something that is brand new new, something that has not happened before. And so, when Jesus shows up on the scene, guess what? Demonic realm forces start to show up everywhere. Why? Because he starts to cast them out. Because light has broken into the world. When Jesus was baptized, the cosmos were ripped open and God, the presence of God, descended upon Jesus, the living, dwelling God among men. So that when he showed up, the demonic went, ah! They've been there undisturbed for a long time. And now Jesus shows up and says, go. One word, get out. And he says, hey, you 12, by the way, you do it too. Why? Because this gospel isn't, it's not limited to, that's a really great idea. It is transformational. It is, when I hear the word of God and I hear Jesus talk to me, something changes. Either I reject him or I get in line. And we love him, so we get in line. It's awesome because we see our lives go, oh yeah, that was never supposed to be there. I wasn't created for that. Victory. Jesus sets them up for victory. And so you get this flow. You get this flow of Jesus being rejected, Jesus coming, Jesus grabbing a hold of his 12, having a little rally and saying, listen, don't be discouraged. It's fine. Continue. Church, We need to stop getting our feelings hurt, okay? People don't really like this. Why? Because the darkness doesn't like this. But we love from a pure heart. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. So when they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Why? Because you're going forth in his spirit. Is this making sense? Let's not get our feelings hurt anymore. Bring the gospel, bring the good news. Love freely, right? By grace you've been saved. Freely you've received, so freely give. He's doing it right here for us. Now, we just said that Jesus has summoned, he sent them out, and he has supplied them for their work. How are we doing? Hey, not so bad. Not so bad. You just never know until you get up here, you know? This is a new perspective, and it's really awesome. You guys are great. But, now, as we move on, he gives them these interesting instructions. I like this. It's so Jesus. It's so... Say that one more time. What did you say? Yeah. He says, verse 8, And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. That's so funny. Like, hey, you got a staff? You got sandals? Yeah, good. You're good. Thanks. <laughs> it's just good. I almost see Peter like, no, man, I'm, I'm going out by myself. Peter, get, take, here, put your sandals on. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of a funny little scene. But it's really beautiful when you compare verse 7 and verse 8. It says, and he gave them authority. Take nothing. He gave them, so take nothing. Do you see where the resource is flying from? It's totally from the impartation of power through the Spirit of God upon their life rather than, hey man, we're going to need a bag. Hey, we better get our ministry budget in order, you know, or else we're not going to make it to Samaria. If we're going to Samaria, I'm not going to Samaria. See what I'm saying? It leads to all this kind of, what? Jesus says, leave it. Take nothing for your journey. You don't need it. Got a staff? Yeah, that'll work. Got sandals? Good. You got to be walking. It's super practical, but at the same sense, it's just beautiful because you're like, you don't need to worry. Matthew 6, oh, microphone. Matthew 6, 33. What does it say? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these will be added to you. So what's the big deal? That's so cool. Jesus practices what he preaches and then he says, you're gonna do it. (laughs) to them. You know, it's kind of different. We're like, ah, I don't really think he really meant that. I need to go pray a little bit more whether or not I should do that. Jesus stares at him and says, hey, take your sneakers off. Sandals. Okay. Makes them, forces them to abandon all that they might really find their resource. So at the end of the day, there is no, well, you know, it could have been the, you know, I was wearing my Nikes, you know, so I did run a little bit faster. 
Nothing. Nothing. It was, did you see what he did? I had nothing. And I was freezing outside. Why? Don't even put on two tunics. You want me to be cold? I don't know. You're just going to have to walk out there and see. Man, that's faith. That's beautiful. That is real life living. That's this transformational gospel taking roots in the physical realm and just pushing out. You know what's awesome about that too? What do you think the villages saw when they saw these men? No bags, no nothing. They're obviously traveling. The staff and sandals. Are they crazy? But what do they do? They gather around them. Why? Because one is saying what? It says right after that, they went out and preached that men should repent. What's going on? We'll get there. But Jesus gives further instruction. He says, don't put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Y'all, I've struggled with that. What on earth does he mean by that? And kind of dawned on me, I think it was yesterday, driving to Kroger. And I was like, oh yeah, wouldn't it be really terrible if I came to your house and I was really there to see you and spend some time with you? And then the next morning I woke up and said, you know, hey, I'm actually going to go to John's. Uh... And we'll meet up when I'm done. It's kind of offending, especially if you're a first century Jewish man and family. Are we not good enough for you? What have we done? Have we offended you in some way? What have I... The questions swirl. The ministry is thwarted. Now we have division. Bummer. There goes that. Rather, instead, Jesus says, Hey, when you enter a town, just go there and stay there. Well, what if they don't have a big screen? Stay there. What if they can't give me steak every night? Stay there. Why? That's not what you're here for. You're here for them. It provides the opportunity for the kingdom work that Jesus has just given them to take root in one household. What happens when one house gets transformed? They go to work and someone else sees it. And it, uh uh-oh, fire. Right? Everything catches fire and off we go. Verse 11. I hope it's okay. I'm just walking through it like this. I don't really have anything good to say. Do you know what I mean? I'm not like, hey, look at my great ideas. I don't have any good ideas. Jesus has really good ideas. Verse 11. um, Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. And then he throws that one in. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you. As you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. That's a pretty somber one. What is he saying? Any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you, what do we just say? They're not rejecting you. Why? I thought you were going in Jesus' authority. Oh, right. Yeah. Christ in me, as I move, I'm speaking his words. See, they're not rejecting you. That's what he says right there. Any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there. You see this in Acts 15 with Paul? What does Paul do? Shakes the dust off the soles of feet. I'm going to the Gentiles. Why? Because you just won't listen to me. Because I've brought the word to you all the time. I came and stayed in your house. Why does he say shake the dust off the soles of your feet? Isn't that kind of a weird thing to say? I've never done that, ever. I don't think any of you have either, maybe. Shaking the dust off the soles of your feet can mean one of two things. I'm convinced it's one of them. It can mean one, I'm going to break my fellowship with you. I'm going to break fellowship with you. It's like, it's like Montana came to practice yesterday, 45 minutes late. Montana, unbelievable. Just get out of my life. Right? It's your unwillingness to care about me. I just reject you. You're unclean to me, and that's what the Jews would did to the Gentiles. Anytime you walk through Samaria, ooh, you walk through Samaria? Man, when you got out of that, you know, you crossed the border, you like shook your clothes. Why? Because they're on me. No joke. That's what it was. It was like they have, they're clinging to me. How am I supposed to go into the temple like this? Wash my hands. So you have this self-preservation. Don't. Right? One or two. I was in your house. I think John chapter 13 was Jesus too. There was a bowl, there was a basin, there was a rag. Jesus stripped his outer garments, nothing but a tunic on, washed his feet. Why? 
When we're washing feet, I'm welcoming you. Hey, glad you got off the road. Good to see you. I love you. I know it's been hard. What's it been like? This is disgusting. I have taken the form of servant to you. Whatever you say, man. Glad you're here. I'm welcoming you into my house. If you shake the dust off the soles of your feet after not being welcome, it is a testimony to the host of that house. Ooh, they didn't wash his feet. What happened? Make sense? I came into your house. You didn't wash my feet. Why? Because you didn't want what I had. <laughs> that's good. Do you see how that's so not self-preservation? That's so not, well, that is, bless your heart. No, it's, I came to your house. I sat with your kids. I preached the word of life to you. Now I'll go on. That's kingdom. That's Jesus. That's, let me walk into where you are. I'm here to bring the gospel to you. Remember, if you're being rejected, it's not you. It's Jesus. So don't be offended. They're not offended. They just shake the dust off their soul to their feet. Why? For a testimony for them. So there'd be no mistaking, you rejected. You chose you. You chose self. It was all about you. You didn't want Jesus. Folks, I say this solemnly and with a lot of realness. There is, oh man, scary to say almost. There is no one in hell that didn't choose to be there. There is no one in hell that did not choose to be there. Yeah. How can you say that? The wages of sin is death. God didn't hit anybody with a hammer. When you get a wage, you've been to work. When you go to work, you work hard at your work. What's your wage? Do you see how it's very active? It's very, I don't want. No thanks. No, I don't. That is what happened at Nazareth. Who is this guy? Jesus. Mary's boy. Let's go. Right? Because you've rejected him. And that's what Jesus is saying as a testimony for them. That they at the end would see, oh man, I think we made a mistake. Right? Right? That leads to what? Repentance. What did they preach? And it says right here, they went out and preached that men should repent. We're almost done, I swear. Men should repent. Repentance is one of those words, it's like, you've either grown up and it's like one of the scariest things in the world, repent, you know? People are outside with like stands yelling at you, repent sinner, you know? <laughs> I can't be it. I don't think that's it. You get confused, it's scary. No, men should repent. Repent is so simple. And it's beautiful and it's right. Repentance in the Greek means just turn around. Turn your face the other way. There we go. Keep walking. Okay. Right? It's, it's comical. It's like, oh, that's not hard. It's not hard. That's the point. Repentance here is not you, 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 you. It's would you turn around from where you have been, from the perspective you've been living in. The kingdom of God has broken into the world and now it's in your face and it's different than what you've been following. Repent. Just turn around. Follow that instead. Right? That's the, that's the gospel message. It's not, I hate you. It's not, I can't believe you did. Remember, because you did too. I did too. And someone said, hey man, the way you're living, just check this out. Look what this guy did. Okay, I'll follow him. There you go. Repentance. Turning. Simple definition. Take this with you. Forsaking the old and embracing the new. Forsaking the old Embrace the new. New has come. Jesus. The kingdom is breaking into the world. The newness of God is here. Repent and believe. Here's the success report. Remember when we said, take nothing because you've been given everything? Watch the result of this. It's like God's economy. It's a lot better than ours. It's not you go to Europe and you're like, man, that only gave me a, like 75 cents. How much is the dollar worth today? 
It's not like that. You know, when you exchange money, it's not like that. It says, they went out and preached that men should repent and they were casting out many demons that, and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Authority. Authority. Why? Did you hum that up? Not at all. Jesus said, I have to drop everything and I just walk with him. Oh, okay. You can do it too. Folks, that's why it's not okay anymore to say, well, you know, I don't have a Bible degree. Do me either. I've never done that. No one has, right? Most of us haven't. So should we let those who have gone to seminary, you know, brother, well, you know, brother, when, when I read, you know, sometimes it just doesn't come out right, you know? It doesn't matter. I thought this wasn't about you. I thought this was about the Spirit of God indwelling you so that he, all his resource would come into you, would proclaim the gospel, and then it's him, right? You had no part in it. It's almost like I was just this vessel that something happened. And you walk around and go, what just happened? That was amazing. Jesus, right? They came. Men should repent. Demons were flying out. People were walking again. It was incredible. If you skip all the way over, they even go farther and come back to Jesus and they start telling him everything that happened. It's like they couldn't help it. It's like you have no idea what happened in Capernaum. No, no, no. No, seriously, dude. Hold on. You don't know. Because it was that powerful. We're going to wrap this up. That's what you're called to. It's easy if you look at the passage. It's easy. Just drop everything and walk with him. Right? Because he summons those who are with him. Not those who have spent their time in, in the, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm not against education. I'm getting too hard on that. I'm not against, I'm not against education, okay? No, but I am saying that this is for the simple too. This is for you and me. This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is, I have one great need. His name is Jesus. And if he would take dominion over my life and I would stop trusting in my talents and my riches to get this kingdom work done, something might actually happen. Okay? Something might actually happen. I know that the, the first thing that kind of comes to mind right now is, perhaps is, well, what about my gifts and talents? Yeah, I know. And you should use them, right? I play guitar. It's great. But it means nothing in my hands. Right? It's just empty. It's man's strength. It's just me trying to make something happen. Jesus says, drop it. Why? So that my resource will take it over and it's new now. Right? That's you. That's you and me. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, let's apply this real quick. And then we'll call it. Yeah, pretty good. And then we'll call it. How are you responding to the word of God? Ask yourself that question. Again, not, not here to hit anybody, not here to do anything. It's a question I ask myself all the time. How are you responding to the words of God when someone enters your house and teaches you something? Do you receive that person? Or are you getting dust shook in your face? When Dwayne gets up here on sound days and preaches, what are you doing? What am I doing? I ask myself that question all the time. Right? Why? Because it's not just good stuff. It's not, hey, that was a really, that, that was nice. It was, if I can listen in to what he's saying, that's the gospel. The gospel might transform it. Oh, and then here we go. Flow. One. Two. As you have been summoned by Jesus, as you have been summoned by Jesus, are you willing to let everything else go and fully consecrate yourself to him? Are you willing to let everything else go and consecrate yourself to him? It's the mark of a Christian. The one who seems to have everything, but you talk to him or her and it's like they have nothing. But it's this genuine humility that... The guy's so smart. No, he's not. They'll reject it over and over again. Why? Because they're not trusting in their resource. They left that a, a long time ago. And they know it's not me, it's Christ. Christ in me. So those two things I want to leave you with. Remember, the second one, are you willing to let it go? That one's hard. Why? Because you have to trust that Jesus is enough. And you're not. Jesus is enough, and you're not. Repent. Turn. It's okay, right? Again, see, didn't it also bring up like bad feelings when I said repent? No. 
just turn around. Let's walk the other way. Let's see who he is and go, right, my resource, my God, my King, what you say I'll do. Because I know you're the one empowering me to will and to work and to do it for me. Okay? I want to leave you with this. Remember this. Remember who you are. Colossians 1.13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And the Greek there means he went into the domain of darkness, reached down, grabbed you, and pulled you to himself. Summoned you. Summoned, right? Summoned you out of darkness where, and transferred you into the kingdom of of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.13. Let that tie in all that we just said that they went through when they got sent out. This ties directly to us, you guys. It's so applicable. It's so real. It's not just like, I can't believe that happened. It's happening. He reached into the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And you know it's so great when you say he transferred the domain, it means all of the authority that that domain had on you is not there anymore. You were gone. This was your domain. You got picked up and you got moved out. So the authority that was holding you in this realm is gone. And it's a lie. And we stare at it and we say, oh, but brother, my sin, you don't know how I am. It's over. If that's true, it's over. The gospel of the kingdom says, God reached in, grabbed you out of the domain of darkness and all of its pull on you, pulled you out into what? The kingdom of his beloved son. What does that mean? All that is in the kingdom, the authority of God, all that is, now you stand in it. It's simple. Oh gosh, that we would just believe that. It's that simple. God did it. You're there. Wow. You can stop striving now. Church, we can stop striving. We can stop pushing. We can start, well, I just wish I could. Oh man, you don't know how hard it is to be a Christian. What is hard about getting picked up out of darkness and into light? The hardness is the lie that you've been told. He has summoned you and now he has supplied you if you would be supplied, what, with the authority of God to break the demonic forces that are saying, remember, you can't, dude. Remember, that's not how it is. Remember, blah, blah, blah. no, 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 no. Oh, man, pornography is just all over you. Oh, man, lust is all over you. Oh, man, greed, you can't help it. Oh, when you gossip, you just can't, blah, 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 blah. Why? Because you've been singing that, you've been sitting in this thinking, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still here. When really, you're right here. And Jesus is going, I'm trying to send you out. I'm, tr- I'm, tr- I'm trying to send you out. You hear? I love you. See what I did? That's it. Gospel. Kingdom. Now you're in this realm. You're in this sphere. So live from here. Praise God. That's it. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It is power that God has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We have been summoned out of darkness. We have been called by God. And now we have been supplied because Christ lives in me. The hope of glory. Do you know what glory means in the Greek? And I'm going to stop, I swear. Do you know what glory means in the Greek? Worth. Christ, the hope of my worth. The hope of when I stand before God, I'm not standing as me anymore. It's Jesus in me. He's my hope of glory, of glorious worth, of everything I need. All I need is him, Jesus. Yes, he summoned you. He's called you. He's ready to send you out. Be sent out. I want to be sent out. Let's pray. Jesus, your word is good. Your word, Lord, never comes back empty-handed. You tell us in Isaiah 55, oh, the free offer of mercy is here. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Embrace me. Embrace me. The Apostle Paul told us that he is forgetting what lies behind. And he's pressing on toward the upward goal and the call of Christ. That I might be united with you. That the kingdom might so fully break into my life. That unity with Christ is not a wish. It's a reality because of what you've done. This is you. I pray Jesus now. Do this in us. 
Convince us of your truth. Transformationally didasco us. Teach us the truth. Congregation, every eye uh, closed, every head bowed. Don't you want that? I want that. I want that more than Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on a Friday night. I want that more than anything this world has to offer, don't you? I want to look my family in the eye and know when I speak to them, I'm speaking kingdom language because Christ is in me. Why don't we all just drop everything? and fully consecrate ourselves to Jesus right now. Will you do that in your heart? I'm calling you to respond. Just respond. Say, yes, Lord, I hear your word. Thank you for not hitting me over the head with it. I love you. You're better than everything else. I consecrate myself to you. You're all I want. Now, take me. I'm yours. Whatever you want is good because I know that you care for me and I love you. Respond. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the worship, for how you have been with us. Pray now. Send us out, Jesus, in your name, in your strength. Glory to glory, grace to grace, all found in Jesus. We love you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Have a great week. Have a great week.